Right, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the third in our series of uh, webinars. And uh, very nice to have everyone with us this afternoon. And yeah, my pleasure on behalf of CSA UK is to welcome uh, a Canadian to our presence. Um, Mark Nunnikoven uh, is the uh, VP Cloud Research at Trend Micro. Um, and is one of the foremost experts on cloud technologies and cybersecurity issues. So it's a real pleasure to have Mark uh, with us this afternoon. And he's going to talk about uh, tackling serverless app security challenges. Mark? Oh, before we start, I should just say, um, obviously this is the third in the series. So um, we want to know your input on what else you would like to hear about. So the way you do that is really easy, cloudsecurityalliance.org.uk, follow the link and there is a nice little form which has literally one box for you to fill in and submit, which is what topics would you like to hear about. So uh, tell us what you'd like to hear about, we will try to arrange it, simple as that. Um, by way of advertising, um, the next um, webinar will be on the 18th, Friday the 18th of November, uh, talking about cloud and privacy. And then um, on the 16th of December, um, we will be looking at uh, 2017 cloud trends and predictions. So a little bit of uh, crystal ball gazing and then hopefully a little bit of fun for in the lead up to Christmas. Um, and so without further ado, Mark, uh, welcome. It is over to you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate it. Um, so just a quick note for everybody on the line um, uh, watching this live. Um, there is a questions functionality here within the um, webinar software. Um, at any time, enter your questions. I'll be trying to monitor that as I go through. Um, and of course, we'll do a quick Q&A at the end if there's any um, lingering questions. So if something uh, jumps to the forefront of your mind, please, by all means, fire it away in the questions uh, box and I'll try to answer it in line. Otherwise, we'll get to them there at the end. Um, so as Paul mentioned, uh, my name is Mark Donakovan. I'm the Vice President of Cloud Research for Trend Micro, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about tackling serverless application security challenges. Now I know this is a new area for most people um, because it's a very new approach to designing web applications in the cloud. So I'm going to start with a little bit of level setting here. We're going to talk exactly about what is serverless. Now, interestingly enough, there's been a ton of controversy around the actual term serverless, um, mainly because you know it's very provocative um, and it's uh, full of it. It's a complete fabrication. Um, so as a warning, I will tell you right now, I am going to um, break some hearts here, I'm going to shatter some illusions um, and talk frankly about what this is. So the biggest thing, let's just hit it head on, um, servers. In a serverless environment, there are still servers. Um, in fact, there is a ridiculous amount of servers. Um, more servers than you probably are used to dealing with, and that's simply due to the way of how the technology is built. Um, you are running um, functions, so you're writing with serverless uh, applications. You are creating code functions that are then run on somebody else's servers. So these are running in AWS, in Microsoft, in Google, um, at IBM, in somebody else's server farm, they are sandboxed, they are executed in uh, an isolated space, but of, in a serverless application, there are still servers. That's why there's a little bunch of controversy around this name. People go, serverless, that's ridiculous. You have to have servers. Of, well, of course you do. The advantage here is that they're simply not your problem. This is the number one takeaway from having a serverless deployment is that your code is executing in somebody else's environment and all of the server maintenance, so operating system patches and updates, running the application stack itself, all of that, not your problem, right? So already uh, the wheels are probably turning and you're realizing that there can be a lot of um, significant operations advantages here and there's a lot of uh, business advantages um, because you're focusing purely on delivering business value and not on maintaining Windows or Linux or running updates for Apache. Um, all that stuff still exists, simply not your problem. Second thing I want to tackle the concept that this is new. The idea of serverless designs and the fundamental principles on which you're going to build these applications is not new at all. Okay, So there are servers 
and it's not new at all. Um, this started uh, the, you know, if we start from the most recent and sort of work our way back, um, there's this trend called microservices. And this idea is um, that you take your web application, so if you have a standard sort of end tier web application with a web front end, a business layer, and some data in the back end, um, what you're going to do is you're going to start to decouple these um, layers and you're going to start to break these um, pieces up into smaller services so that you can uh, iterate on them independently. So you'll have a service that provides authentication. You'd have a service that provides user profiles. You'd have a service that um, shows catalog data in an e-commerce app. You'd have a service that handles uh, the shopping cart. Um, so you break up all these logical pieces of your application into what's called a microservice. The advantage here is that you can now update and deploy new versions of each of these independent services without breaking the rest of the piece of the puzzle. So if you want to add some functionality to the shopping cart, you can go ahead and do that. The areas of concern around microservices are the borders, so the edges, how they interact with the other services. So as long as you keep that relatively static, um, you can have this uh, really interesting decoupled organization of your application and do some really good changes as opposed to having um, what's termed a monolith, so one big stack of code that runs everything and where you have a huge amount of tightly coupled dependencies. So that was microservices and, and that came into play um, really into the forefront about five years ago. We started seeing that term in, in 2011. But even that wasn't really new. For those of you, um, you know, who've been doing this for a little while longer, um, in 2003, we really started hearing about service-oriented architectures. So um, they were uh, coming forward at the same time as um, web services. In fact, um, service-oriented architectures been around long enough that the um, W3C actually has a standard published for it. So all those competing voices have agreed, have um, revised gone through the draft, gone through the voting process, and actually ratified a standard. That's how old this structure is. And again, very similar principle to what we talked about in microservices, but the technology and the, um, the tool sets really weren't there to break them up to this fine level of granularity. You tended to have bigger um, services, something like an LDAP directory, um, you know, a cluster of databases, um, things like that. But same principle where you had things, um, services or um, operations within your uh, application that were focused on doing one thing and doing it well. But even before that, um, so now I'm really going to start to show my age here, um, we had uh, something called CORBA the common object request broker architecture. And you saw this mainly in enterprise applications, a little bit in Windows. Um, and what it was was a way for um, objects within a code base um, and sometimes exposed externally, which is a whole new security nightmare, um, to talk to each other. And so this was a standard way of passing information back and forth and being able to provide this sort of service type architecture. And that was the early 90s we had that. Again, Continuing to, you know, you, by the time I finish this slide, you can probably figure out how much gray is in my hair. Um, before that, we had dynamic data exchange. This was primarily Microsoft and Windows. Uh, but again, similar concept. You had one application or one service in the operating system providing a service to the other so that you didn't have to write a new one. And this one started up in the late 80s. If we go all the way back, um, into uh, the core and the way that this started out, we get back to one of my all-time favorites, which is the Unix philosophy. So not a straight technology, but a philosophy of how to do things. And that breaks down to very simple. Um, this is summarized up as, you know, write programs that do one thing and do it well, write programs that work together, and write programs to handle text streams because that's a universal interface. So already you can see the parallel to what we consider modern serverless applications, right? There's not a lot of difference here. The, the difference is essentially scope. The Unix philosophy was primarily around either a mainframe structure or within the client itself. Um, but that concept has been expanded out to larger, um, broadly distributed applications. So if we update this Unix philosophy, uh, what we end up with is something along these lines. Write services that do one thing and do it well. Write services that work together 
And instead of text streams, we're going to write programs that probably handle JSON because that's a universal um, interface. So that's JavaScript object notation. It doesn't have to be just in JavaScript, but essentially it's a much lighter weight way of defining data um, that you can pass around. So instead of using uh, something like XML, which is very verbose and um, rather clunky and hard to read, um, JSON can be uh, rather compact um, and easily manipulated with pretty much any programming language out there. So this is the approach that you're taking in these serverless environments, and what it results in is uh, my definition for serverless, which is a serverless app is a collection of services stitched together to deliver some sort of business value. Okay? So very simple. This, like I said, this is not new. There are, in fact, servers, but that's the overall concept of this serverless um, initiative. So you might say, well, why are people pushing this way? Why are people pushing towards uh, serverless deployments? Yes, there's that you know, inevitable group of people who there's a new shiny new toy out there, a shiny new buzzword, and they jump on board. And It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's the right technical fit. Um, they will just try to deploy it, you know, come heck or high water. Well, with serverless, there's some real driving factors here as to why you would want to be looking at this in your organization. And this is key to understanding um, how we need to go about securing these things. So it all starts with what we call the shared responsibility model. Now the good news is, as you well know, being a members of the Cloud Security Alliance and being aware of some basic cloud security tenants, this works across all cloud service providers. It's, even, uh, it's not just exclusive to cloud, it's essentially how IT operations work. You're sharing some level of responsibility among teams or among uh, organizations or third parties or however it may break, break down. But if we look at it, um, looking at uh, keeping in mind something like an AWS, um, or uh, Microsoft Azure or the Google Cloud Platform, one of the big cloud service providers, or even IBM Bluemix, um, it kind of breaks down, as you see here on the screen across the slides. We've got infrastructure services, um, platform as a service, and software as a service, um, all, all the way across in the three columns here. And each of them share the same areas of day-to-day -day responsibility for both security and operations. And if we start on the left-hand column, you'll see the dividing line is at the virtualization layer in the operating system. So your cloud service provider is going to take care of all of the physical, all of the infrastructure, and all of the virtualization operations and security where you take over is at the operating system. So if you deploy an instance in AWS or a virtual machine in one of the other cloud service providers, you're presented with the operating system and everything on top of it to configure how you want. Now, as a security person, you can see the downside of that. Um, as a developer, you might see the upside of that going, hey, I can build whatever I need to build. There's no restrictions. It's just like I had full access to the box. Security people should have alarm bells going off in your head, you know, as soon as you hear full access to the box, um, because it is correct, you know, your initial assumption is correct. You can do whatever you want with these instances and virtual machines. You can leave things wide open. You can have admin accounts with low um, passwords. Um, you can have uh, applications that are unpatched, because it's up to you to maintain the uh, security and operational feasibility for everything above that virtualization layer. So you're responsible for operating system application and data. If we shift over a bit and look at platform services, so these are um, sort of a little bit more abstract. Uh, so think uh, like um, a Salesforce um, or Heroku. Uh, you know, these are things that give you building blocks where you can build an application on top of them. Now, you're still responsible for your data as well, but you've lost the responsibility for the operation, uh, operating system. Right now, that's a big advantage for you. And if we move all the way over to SaaS apps, so think like Office 365, Google Docs, um, Workplace, you know, all these types of things. All you're responsible for now is the data, because even the application is taken care of by the provider. Now, if we look, take a serverless view of this, we're not going to touch infrastructure as a service. We don't deal with it at all. There may be some, uh, now there's basically a crossover between SaaS and PaaS where we kind of are responsible for the application because we are deploying our own code, and, but primarily we're worried about where our data is and what we're um, doing to secure that. 
Now another way to look at that sort of matrix is with this chart. Now there's no numbers because the numbers aren't really important. What you're looking here is relative to the other columns. So if we look at the infrastructure, you know, it's the most initial effort, the most, uh, it gives you the most flexibility as an advantage. The disadvantage is that you have the biggest ongoing effort um, and you're taking on a significant amount of risk. When you move to platform as a service, that all drops. And when you finally go over to software as a service, it drops even more. So there's a lower initial effort, there's lower ongoing effort, but you also lose some flexibility here because you're um, working in somebody else's sandbox, as it were. So this is when you're looking across these different services. And the idea is you want to be as far over to the right as possible the majority of the time, simply because you're getting more business value for your investment. This means that you may not be spending less, but you're probably getting more bang for your buck. So if you think of something uh, like a web publishing platform, well, you can run a whole web infrastructure and scale your site up and deal with load balancers and the database backend and performance tuning and all this. Or if you deployed on uh, a web hosting platform, um, you know, uh, that's more of a software service, all that's taken care of for you and you can just worry about your content. Well, you still have a lot of investment in that content, but you're probably getting more business value for the time and money you're spending there. And this is really the main thrust of serverless is that you want to be doing more with less. You're probably spending a similar amount, though there can be some savings with serverless simply because you're not having servers idle. Um, you know, computation in a serverless environment is typically charged on the millisecond time frame. So think about that for a second. If you're executing code in a serverless environment, your bill is based on the milliseconds that that code was executing, not on the server sitting idle for hours on end um, or you know, at 70% capacity. Um, you're being charged purely for computational ex uh, execution time. So now if you're thinking, okay, that's great, but it's not for real applications. I can't really do much in these serverless platforms. I'll give you a quick idea, a couple companies, a couple examples I pulled out um, uh, of some great work that's being done in a serverless environment. So a cloud guru is a training company. Fantastic certification um, training as well as general cloud awareness and knowledge. Everything they've done is completely serverless. They were one of the first um, pioneers in this area. They pushed things forward. Um, very small team was able to stand up a really complex um, learning platform um, that engaged a huge amount. So you can see right on the landing page, 90,000 plus people have taken uh, one of their courses and they don't run a single server. It's all serverless. Similarly, um, Instant is a content management system. Um, very cool system, uh, lets you um, build and deploy your websites. Um, completely serverless. Um, very interesting technology approach there. Um, and then here's another one, it's pure outside of technology. Uh, this is a business um, real estate searching app, so uh, commercialsearch.com. Um, and it's again, it's all serverless. So this is looking at real estate listings, it's pulling in information from other systems, um, but it's completely uh, serverless. So it's been a, they've, these companies have been able to develop something quickly um, but also um, very effectively from an operations perspective because they're pouring all their time and effort into um, pure business value as opposed to running Windows um, or updating Apache. So that's the baseline, that's the level set. And I know for those of you that are already familiar with serverless, that was a bit of a detour, but I think it's really important to be clear what we're talking about when we're talking about this serverless um, designs because there is a lot of misconception, there is a lot of um, weight to that term, um, it sort of uh, brings to, to mind a lot of these ideas. Well, on a similar bend, and this is going to be a little weird for most of you, but I think it's really good to challenge um, your assumptions often, um, we're going to talk about what security actually means because one of the things you'll notice in the serverless environments, um, you really need to put that question to yourself is what are we doing with security? What are we actually trying to accomplish? A lot of the time in a traditional estate, um, when you're dealing with a data center, um, you go through the motions of, okay, we need a firewall, we need intrusion prevention, we need anti-malware everywhere. Um, you know, we need a SIM system to put events upstream into so that we can do analysis. And controls are great, but you know, a lot of people tend to miss the key question as to why are you doing those? Why are you implementing these controls? And are they the most effective choice to accomplish the goal that you're trying to meet? They probably are, but you need to know why so that you can make intelligent choices about the technology. And serverless really forces you to do that because we've lost the ability 
to apply most of those controls because we simply don't have access to those lower levels where those controls go. A lot of the database controls we do have rely on having access to the operating system or acting as a proxy which can have significant performance impacts. So I, I want to question your understanding of what security actually means and I'm going to start that by giving you a bit of a developer's perspective. So I've been developing code, writing code for a really, really long time, and you know it's fun, it's great, it's creative. I work with a lot of engineers, um, you know, in other projects, but also at Trend Micro. And developers tend to have a very specific mindset. When a developer thinks something is done, it's because they've had an idea to solve a problem. They write the code, and then they run some tests. And they run the code, and it solves that problem. Right? So I say, I want to figure out what the fastest way to get from my house to the coffee shop is. Okay, great. I'll pull in all this data from the maps. I'll write this search algorithm. I'll run these potential routes. I'll do all this, and it'll spit out an answer at the end. And so I you know, put my head down. I work with the team, and I build out some code, and voila, we get an answer. And I go, hey, this is done. This is successful. The security mindset is very, very similar. We work with the development teams, we work with the solution teams, and we say, hey, great, you're building this little app to figure out how to get to the coffee shop the most effective way. The difference is at the end stage, as opposed to saying, hey, you got an answer that, you know, it take, you know, take left here, take a right here, and you'll be at the coffee shop 10 minutes faster. The security mindset is more of, okay, that's great that it solves the problem. What else is that system capable of doing? What else can it be made to do outside of what you want it to do? And that's the primary difference between development and the security mindset is that developers focus on solving a problem while security looks at what else those solutions can be used for. And it's a massive gap in perception where development considers it's done because it solved the problem. And the security mindset is great, what else is it capable of, right? So if you take the really basic example um, and you say, I, you know, I built a hammer, so now I can pound this nail into the board, security sits there and goes, okay, well, what else could the hammer be used for? Can someone pop out that nail and use that nail for something else? And what could the board also be used for? So it's a lot more cynical for sure, but it's also a lot broader perspective. And the challenge is, is that these shouldn't be two different perspectives. They should be the same perspective. Um, so security really means ensuring that solutions handle data as expected and only as expected under appropriate circumstances. So obviously we can secure things, uh, lock them down crazy tight, um, but is that appropriate? If you're defending a school lunch menu um, application, you probably don't need the same level of control as something that GCHQ is building right, or you're building something for parliament. It's not the same level, it's not the same threat matrix. Um, so you need to put the appropriate circumstances. So when that comes to our serverless designs, there's four major areas that we want to start to look at, okay? And now we're restricted in what we can do in each of these areas, but there's still the main areas where we want to look at. So we want to look at data flow, so where's our data? What is our data? Where is it? And where is it being processed and stored? We want to look at code quality. This is a huge one. And we also want to look at third parties. Because serverless apps by design pull in information from all these other services and interact with different APIs, third party trust is a huge issue. So we need to look at that. And then monitoring. Just because we're not running the operating system application layer doesn't mean we don't have any operational duties. So monitoring is still absolutely key. We need to ensure that our, our solution is not only solving the problem as we expect, but not doing anything unexpected. So that's where we're sitting right now. Okay, we've looked at what serverless is. We know it's this collection of services that are gonna solve a business problem. We know it's a huge advantage because there's a focus on business value. You're not doing basic administration stuff that's not a competitive advantage. Nobody's going to get ahead because they can administer Windows better, right? That's stuff you should be farming out. It's stuff you shouldn't be worrying about. You should be worried about focusing on your business value. But the problem there is because you're farming so much out and you're high up in the abstract, you're high up in the stack, and you normally only can work on your application and its design and worry about the data, we're losing a lot of our standard security controls, right? You can't throw intrusion prevention um, on a um, function that's running for three milliseconds. It just doesn't work. It doesn't uh, get implemented in the same way. So that's forced us to question 
what we're doing for security, right? So we looked at security in a little a more abstract way, and we know that what we want to do is ensure that our solution is only solving the problem and not being used for anything else outside of that solution. So we're going to dive into each of these four areas now that we've kind of set the level and we have a better understanding of what we're trying to accomplish in the environment of, of these serverless applications. So we'll start with data flow. Now, I wish I had better news for you here, but there are no tools that are going to help you in this scenario. This area is mainly a manual exercise. Okay, so we have a goal, and our goal is really, really simple. And this should be basic security question 101. Where is my data? Right? Now, that's a simple question. You would be utterly shocked to see how many people out there don't actually ask this question. Where is my data? The immediate follow-up to that is, is it adequately protected? So this is adequate is a, you know, a chose that term specifically because it is somewhat vague because it depends on the data. If you're protecting uh, personally identifiable information, so PII, you're falling under um, the data protection regulations and you're going to need to have a higher standard than if you were protecting something like um, image files that you just didn't want hot linked from another site to save on bandwidth costs, right? So where's my data? Is it adequately protected? And unfortunately, as I said, there's no magic bullet here. There is no, uh, or no silver bullet. There's no magic beans. Um, really what this works down to is roll up your sleeves, grab a pencil, um, you know, or grab a dry erase marker and step up to the whiteboard, and you're going to look around, and you're going to write it down. Really, really low tech. Now, on the bright side, this is a really good opportunity, and there are some companies that are doing some interesting work, some startups that are doing some interesting work in this area, and some open source projects that are trying to tackle it, of automatically mapping out data flow in these applications. But it's really, really uh, difficult technical problem because you don't have access to most of this stuff. So we're going to fall back to these basics. You're going to take your architecture. Uh, diagram, you're going to look at it, you're going to analyze each step, you're going to trace the workflow of the application, and you're going to write down what data is processed where and when under which circumstances. So let's walk through a really simple example of that right now. So here we have a basic aspect of an application. So we've got our user up in the top left hand corner, um, and you know they go to the application. Let's just say it's a, it's a web app that requires some authentication for something. Let's say it's a shopping application, right? E-commerce is pretty straightforward for most people to relate to. Excuse me. So we've got this application. The user requires um, to be logged in if they're actually going to make a purchase. So that means we have some sort of authentication service. Now that authentication service also is going to be dealing with a business logic service um, to determine uh, you know, if we have credit card on file, if we have shipping information on file, all this types of stuff, all these types of information. And then there's this data uh, store somewhere in the back end. And now these are all um, different services. And they may not all be under your control. So very, very common in a serverless application is that you're um, outsourcing authentication to a third party. So whether it's an actual startup company like Auth0, um, which is very popular in the serverless community, or if it's uh, along the lines of uh, AWS IAM, um, or if it's uh, federated through SAML back to your um, on-premise directory, um, there is some sort of uh, authentication service that's going to be able to provide um, that uh, information back to your application of whether or not this is a legitimate user. Now the question is, where does this information flow? So the user obviously has some sort of authentication record and that's got to be verified. So if I try to log in, now it's going to give me, uh, you know, whether I've successfully logged in, um, and uh, if I have, it'll give me a set of uh, either a token to identify me, which I can then check my authorizations against. So now, ideally, but you have to verify this, coming out of this authentication service is simply just a token. But you don't know until you look. So you're going to map this data. You know that the authentication service has significant amounts of data about your user. But where else is it flowing? Is it just the token that goes to the logic layer, or does the logic service also have access to personal information? So you need to map this stuff out, which means you're probably going to have to roll up your sleeves and dig into how some of these services work.
And that kind of brings up another major area for uh, security in serverless environments is that as a security team, you're going to need some development skills. You're going to need comfort level looking at uh, code. You're going to need comfort level talking to the development teams on their terms. So you're going to have to understand things like continuous integration and continuous deployment. You're going to have to understand the scope of their tests. You're going to have to understand um, the principles on which they're building. And if you can do that, you can have a much more productive conversation. Because that's what you're going to have to do here with the logic layer is understand exactly what is coming out of the authentication service and what the logic layer is consuming there. If it's simply a token that's a one-time use token, then it's not that bad. But if it's sending a whole profile of your user, well, now you have personally identifiable information in at least two places, in the authentication service as well as in the logic service. And you're going to need to ensure that there are appropriate controls in both. Now, if you add that third connection in place, if you add that connection to the data store, you're going to have to ask the exact same questions. Are, is that information, is that personally identifiable information also being shuttled off into the data store? Because if it, if it is, now you have three separate places that act independently, that are updated independently, that are operated independently, that are storing that personally identifiable information. So you can see very quickly that this can be um, very challenging. Um, but when you try to go to the apply a control, it makes it even more difficult because you might not have the same level of access to these three separate services, so you can't just roll out one control. You can't say, oh, I'm simply going to store, uh, you know, I'm going to apply intrusion prevention at every one of these points to ensure that there's no network attacks, or I'm going to roll out anti-malware at all of these to ensure that they are, um, there are no um, malicious viruses or backdoors or trojans or anything running on these services because you simply do not have the access. That makes it really, really challenging, and we're going to dive into that in a few minutes. But the key here of looking at your data flow is that you're going to map the key data and services together. So you're going to look at things like personally identifiable information, things like financial information. Um, anything that's sensitive, uh, you want to map it out and map what services touch it when. And then you want to start listing the controls out for each of those data and service pairings. Okay, so you want to look at that and you want to see if we have adequate control. So if you have a list that provides all of your data that's in your application, so you, if we use, uh, let's use a cloud guru as an example. So that's the training uh, company that we saw earlier. Um, so they have student profiles. Well, in the student profile, there's going to be personally identifiable information. They also, in that student uh, record, there's probably a list of all the courses they've taken, a list of the videos, uh, some of the comments they've made on the site and in the forums, um, you know, things like that. Now, of that information, the PII, the personally identifiable stuff, is the biggest um, concern for us from a data perspective. This is the user's address, um, their billing address, um, things like that. When we go to the list of courses that they're taking, that's not nearly as sensitive. Same with the forum comments because they're already public. Um, so we go down this list of data and we're going to assign the sensitivity to it. Then we're going to start to look at what services have each piece of this data. Now when you look at um, this and you say, okay, well, uh, let's say we're storing our personally identifiable information in a database store, a service, but that database service is encrypted at rest, it's encrypted in transit, um, and we've locked down the access to it so that only certain functions that are running in our serverless app can access the data store. So we've made sure that we've got appropriate controls. Whereas, you know, the forum posts are publicly displayed and they're stored in um, a content delivery network around the world and a number of other public places. But because the data isn't nearly as sensitive, we're not as concerned about it. But you only get that level of insight if you go through this exercise of mapping out what data is in your application, where it's being processed, and when. So that's a really key. And I know, unfortunately, it is a manual exercise, but sometimes it's fun to roll up your sleeves, book a couple hours, um, bring in some food, get the team there and work through it on a whiteboard together to understand exactly how data is going through. And it's not just a security exercise, that's a big operations exercise as well. Um, there's a huge advantage there and I think you'll see um, as a continuing theme, not just in serverless, but in cloud in general, 
that the more you cooperate and the more you break down these barriers um, and the more you see operations as simply operations, it's not security operations, you know, uh, system operations and development operations, it's all just simply IT delivery. It's all one big operations pod. There's very little difference in um, the process that each of these teams go through. So there's very little sense in having them separate teams. It's much stronger when you get multiple perspectives and do a cross-functional team in there, which sort of ties to the whole DevOps and DevSecOps movements. Now the second big area we want to tackle, um, and this one makes a lot of security folks sort of squirm because they're not comfortable with it, is code quality. Now code quality means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, um, and their great news is there's a ton of great tools out there to help ensure that developers are building quality code. A lot of great processes and techniques that help with this as well, like test-driven development, um, you know, automated testing, continuous ing integration. All of these things are designed to help improve code quality. But for us, for our perspective, really what we want to make sure is that the code does what we want and only what we want. So very similar, again, to the overall concept of security, right? We want to make sure that whatever code is being deployed into Lambda, into cloud functions, into whatever um, service we're using for our serverless app, that it's only executing what we want. Now, when this comes down to uh, what can you do about it, there's really two major things. One is manual, um, and, or two of them are manual, and then one it can be automated. So on the automated side, you want to be running static analysis tools. Okay, now these are basic tools that are going to ensure that there's um, things like common uh, buffer overflows aren't in the code, um, that it's not making unauthorized calls, that um, all the variables are declared. Basically, they're code hygiene tools, and they're an automated way to look at the code and go, this seems to follow most best practices. Now, they won't catch logic errors, but they will catch syntactical, uh, syntactical and basic mistakes in the code. Now, the logic errors, that's where we do code review. So this is when the development team or a pair of developers walk through the code and ensure what they've just written is going to do what they intend to do. Now the security angle is you want to get that team also thinking about what else it could be made to do. So if they're looking at a function that takes in a URL and then pulls in data from that URL, they're going to look at it from a perspective, a development or a developer's perspective, sorry, is, okay, I've been given a URL, I want to make sure it's a valid URL, and then I want to go out and download that data into the local system. The security perspective is, okay, what's the reputation of that URL? Is that URL downloading malicious code? Is it um, trying to implement a buffer overflow in the um, web library? Is there anything bad um, that this URL, that given a random URL that this code could be made to do? Now, that's difficult for a security um, team to do the analysis on, but it's not difficult for the security team to raise those questions during code review with the developers. So that's a different role for the security team, but it's one you really need to embrace as you move forward. And this just isn't about serverless. This is about cloud in general. Everything's moving towards more developer-driven, developer-centric, um, and you need to be in there having these conversations. So while you might not understand the code you're seeing, you can certainly ask those questions when they say it takes a URL as an input but you can very much ask as a security person saying, well, how do we know that's a good URL? How do we know that's not malicious? How do we know that's not actually command and control? Or how do we safely sandbox the download and ensure that it's not malicious before we move forward? There are tools to help you with that, but the main tool is asking that question in the, in the first place. Now, the other area I wanted to highlight here uh, during code quality is third-party libraries. There is a ton of fantastic third-party libraries out there that help developers write code faster. So if you're interfacing with something like Facebook, you're going to use Facebook's official library. You're not going to write your own because it's already been written for you. So why would you write new code if you can just use somebody else's? And that's an excellent principle. Security minds are probably already spinning, getting a little nervous, because Obviously, if it's a third party wrote it, that means somebody else is responsible for the quality and somebody else is responsible um, for the security of that library. But because you're using it in your application, you're also responsible to make sure that um, doing something malicious or could be used as an exploit. And the more third party libraries you use, the more sources you need to verify for patches, the more times you need to keep things up to date, and the more complex the application gets and the harder it is to update each individual piece. Now I want to do a specific call out, I don't normally call out specific technologies, but as security folks you need to know this. Um, 
a lot of people in the serverless world are using um, a development platform called Node.js. So this is a JavaScript-based, event-driven platform. From a development perspective, it enables a whole lot of really interesting, dynamic, real-time updates between the web server and web clients. Um, it's got a lot of flexibility, and it's an immensely popular platform. There's a huge amount of third-party libraries. The big security warning I want to give you is the fact that most of these libraries are a ridiculously massive spiral of dependencies. So when you add um, one Node.js library, it's called an NPM, uh, to your project, odds are that one library also added six or seven in the background. I was uh, deploying um, one um, library into a serverless application uh, to test out for a startup that I've been helping out uh, advise, and I looked at the dependency chain, and there one library, which was basically just sending one chunk of information upstream, had 68 different third-party library dependencies. 68, just for some basic functionality that made it easier for a developer to write a bit of code. Now, they could have gone the long way and maybe written about 50 lines more of code to make that work. Instead, they use this library, which from a process perspective makes perfect sense. But when you look at it from a security perspective, you've just now injected 68 external dependencies into your application in order to make your life a little bit easier. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more of those dependencies there. So if you're running a Node.js library, excuse me, or sorry, a Node.js application, from a security perspective, you want to be looking at all the libraries that are included because you need to now look for all of those libraries to see if there are security updates or patches um, and if they're being updated and uh, included securely. So big warning there. It's not enough to shy away from the platform because it enables a huge amount of really cool functionality, but your security hat on, you need to be aware of these dependencies. So the biggest thing that you can do here um, is to ensure that you're using proper sanitization. Okay, just like the hospital, just like the NHS, we want to make sure that we've got a clear messaging to our development teams about sanitization. We want to um, very much, you know, you enter the building, you use some sanitizer, you wash your hands, same thing on the way out. Same thing for your applications. We have very little control of what goes on inside the services, but we can definitely control what we're sending to the services and what we're doing with the output from these services. The good news is here, don't build your own sanitizers. There are excellent ones available for free um, out there. So OWASP um, has a great set of uh, sanitization libraries. Um, most of the major development frameworks have main de facto standard uh, sanitization libraries. So an easy way to think about this is um, if you're building that e-commerce app that takes um, comments or reviews, you want to sanitize that input to make sure that there's no script in there or there's no URLs that go to malicious sites, um, that there's you know, no bad uh, HTML being input in your database. So you want to very much ensure that you're sanitizing the input and the output of these services. And again, that's you've got to work hand in hand with the development teams. Now that's hard, I understand, but it's something you really need to push forward on uh, because it's the key to being successful in these new application environments. So this, the result of this, of focusing on code quality, is it also gives you a clarity of purpose for the code and a key understanding of the attack surface. Okay, and that's, that's very challenging to do in a normal environment. Um, the advantage here with serverless is that you know exactly where the code is and you know that it's running in a sandboxed environment so it has a much smaller surface. You can look at just the code itself. Whereas in a traditional web application, not only do you have to look at the code, you have to look at the configuration of uh, the server it's running on. You have to look at the configuration of the operating system that that server is running on and of the cluster and how that cluster is balanced um, to ensure that attack surface. When it comes to serverless applications, it's far simpler um, because your code is running in a service that is designed to sandbox code. And that brings us to our um, other, another area, which is third parties. The cloud is all about third parties, and especially for um, businesses and organizations in the EU, this is really, really challenging. Um, and it's primarily challenging because a lot of the leading edge cloud stuff is unfortunately in the US. 
And as a Canadian, I say that as well because Canada is very similar um, data privacy restrictions and regulations to uh, the EU. So normally what we see is a leapfrog. When the EU originally had uh, the first round of uh, data privacy regulations, um, Canada learned from that and we pushed out stricter ones. And then now you've just leapfrogged us again um, with last summer's uh, new data protection regulation. And we're going to, I imagine, leapfrog again in a couple years when we review ours. Uh, but as a Canadian, we have very similar challenges um, because most of these, so AWS is headquartered out of the U.S., um, a lot of these third-party startups are um, headquartered in the U.S. They have a very different structure around data privacy, um, around data regulation, um, around breach notification, things like that. So when you're dealing with third parties, um, you get into this nebulous web and away from technologies and more into business and uh, legal and privacy restrictions, uh, but it's still just as critical to understand. So the goal here is to understand who you're trusting and to verify what they're saying. Okay, I'm all for trusting people, uh, but as a security guy, I have to verify. So for the big cloud service providers, where the verification comes into effect is through compliance reports. So the big three here are in a logo war. Um, if you go to these sites, so the compliance page uh, for each of these cloud service providers, you're going to see just a logo soup, right? All these logos, stuff you've never heard of, um, and the big ones you have. So PCI, um, SOC 2, SOC 3, um, ITAR, um, like all these, some that you, you know, ISO 27001. Um, these are uh, areas where these cloud service providers and some of their services, not all, but they list which ones, are compliant with these various frameworks. And now you can't do an audit of these third-party cloud service providers, but they will provide you with the audit evidence done by one of the major um, four or five auditors around the world. So uh, they typically get someone like Ernst & Young or Deloitte or KPMG um, to do their auditing, and they will provide that audit report to you as a customer. So if you're a customer running on Azure and you're trying to make a PCI compliant workload, um, you can get the PCI uh, compliance report for the services you're using from the Azure support team. So that's how you can verify that they're actually doing what they say they're doing. It's not direct verification, but it's good enough and it's the best you're going to get. Um, but you need to make sure, if you're dealing with a smaller cloud service provider or you're trying to stand up your own, this is what you need to be able to provide to your customers to ensure that not only are you meeting um, certain security and privacy uh, commitments, but that you're consistently meeting them and that you're compliant at any given time. Because as a user, when you're signing up for these services, you are inherently expanding your ring of trust. So a lot of the time where I get asked this question is around encryption. Okay, and people will ask, well, if I'm encrypting data and my virtual machine is running in the cloud, doesn't the cloud provider have access um, to the memory of the system that's got the, the key in memory? And the answer is yes, theoretically they do. And the only assurance that you have that they're not randomly scraping memory for um, encryption keys beyond the fact that that's an immensely challenging technical problem at the scale they're operating at is these compliance reports because part of the client's compliance reports especially SOC 2 and SOC 3 um, and ISO 27001 is around their operational procedure and you'll find that uh, at least the big three have some of the best operational procedures on the planet. They've got a really high level of rigor uh, because the advantage we have as users is that these cloud service providers will live and die based on their reputation. The difference between a virtual machine deployed in AWS, in Azure, in Google, in IBM is minimal, right? You can get the same types of service from all three for that basic concept of a server. The price varies very little bit. They are competing on price as well, but you can guarantee that as soon as one of them has a major breach, they will no longer be considered because there is such a small bar of difference on those basic services. Where these com cloud providers are competing are on higher level services, on more abstract level services, on adding more value and making it easier to build on there. But if you just need to stand up a server, or in our case, if you just need to deploy a function, all three are more than adequate. So trust is a huge part of that. And if the companies aren't able to deploy um, and aren't able to consistently demonstrate trust and reputation, um, then it makes it really difficult for them to do business. So that's an advantage for us. 
But the biggest thing with third parties is establishing this trust, but then working to this level of trust. So once you are in and once you say we're comfortable with somebody else running all our physical hardware and you're continuing, you're, you set up some sort of method to verify that on a regular basis. So every few months you're up to, uh, making sure that they're still compliant and you're checking their latest compliance reports. Work to that level. Don't second guess yourself. Um, don't start making, um, you know, don't, if you haven't set uh, your service provider as a primary um, target or as a, an access point where you think they're going to be um, hacking into your stuff, then don't start behaving like they would. So you, what do you want to do is establish a trust and figure out how far you trust your cloud provider and then work right up to that boundary. And anything beyond that boundary, you're going to want to apply either process or controls that ensure that you're um, not uh, breaching that trust that you've established. So again, if we use an encryption example, um, and I know this is a bit of an abstract concept, but it's important to remember, if you sit and look and say, I'm going to encrypt all my data that's sitting in the cloud, that's a great idea, in transit and at rest. The real question is, where are you putting the keys when the keys are at rest? So if you're putting the keys in a hardware security module, then it really doesn't matter who's got that hardware security module because it's built to only allow keys to authorize users. So if you're hosting that um, it, with a cloud service provider, that's great. But you might also want to host that on-premise so that your keys are with you and you have control over your keys, even though your encrypted data is sitting in some region of some cloud provider somewhere else. So you've established that you trust them storing your encrypted data, you trust them storing the key when it's in active use, but you want to ensure that you keep the key yourself simply because the data is of a certain sensitivity that you want to ensure that you always have that key um, under your control. So that's what I mean by working to the established trust, is understanding the limits, understanding the trust boundaries, and working right up to those. Now the fourth area that we want to tackle for serverless security is monitoring. So this is an operational task, and I mentioned earlier that we don't want to uh, divide security operations outside of normal operations and development operations, where security as a specialization is knowledge in incident response um, and in primarily forensics afterwards. And where you really want to put your uh, security team's focus um, outside of helping in incident response and forensics is in audit and assurance. Standard day-to-day -day operations should be uh, helping the main operational team work through this stuff. And this comes with monitoring as well. So our goal here is that we want to ensure that everything's working. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simply. Uh, it's pretty simple to implement. But the big key for serverless is that we want to respond automatically when it's not. Because everything is code in these environments and everything's available through an API, it means we can set up some really interesting environment uh, uh, responses to when we know that something's gone off the rails. So if we look at our application again, we see that we've got multiple sources and multiple services and multiple levels of visibility into each of these services. So maybe the app section here is running um, off of a static server system at a cloud service provider. Maybe we farmed our authorization out to a service like Auth0 um, our logic layer is running custom functions that we've written, and our data is in another third-party um, service that we've uh, subscribed to. So we have four different areas and four different systems that are serving up key pieces of our overall serverless application. From an operations perspective, this is wonderful because we're doing a very little work to get a really complex and valuable app out to our users. From a monitoring perspective, it's a pain in the you-know-what. Because you have different levels of visibility and different sources of this information, the last thing you want to do is start to check four different sources of information to figure out if something is going wrong. Because A, it's frustrating, it's difficult, you're going to miss something, but also you don't get that correlation. So the idea here is that you want to set up some sort of central event flow. So again, this is a great actual serverless application to build, um, which is monitoring your serverless application. Um, now, serverless is always event-driven, so this can be really low cost, but think of this very similar to your traditional data center design where you have a monitoring network in place and you're pushing all the logs and flow information upstream to one place for analysis. You want to do the same thing here with your serverless designs, but the difference is you're going to be building a lot of this by hand. So you're going to be consuming what log information is provided from each of these services, also doing some polling 
So calling into the services and saying, hey, what's the status? Is everything still the same? You're also going to want to pull in information from where you're deploying this application, so from your build service. And we want to put it all into one flow, so one place where you can check. And that's going to be a data store. That's also probably going to be a notification queue or something along those lines. Um, and that's where you can start to look for similar issues, so that if there's a number of failed auths and then a massive pull out of the data store, you'll be able to spot that if you have it set up as central. But if you don't have the centralized um, data flow and event flow, you're going to have to look at the authorization service, realize that there's a bunch of failed authorizations, and then also happen to see it in the data store that there was a massive download just after that. Well, if you have it set up as a central flow, things like that are readily are much more uh, readily apparent. So set up this idea of central event flow. Every time you use a new service, make sure that it's pushing into the central event flow. Um, it sounds kind of complicated, but it's actually ridiculously easy to set up and immensely valuable, not just from a security perspective, but from operations in general. So the goal here and the result is setting up this unified stream of events that are happening within your application because your application is no longer sitting on one server or one set of servers you can point to. Your application is this collection of services that may or may not belong to your organization that you may or may not have visibility um, to a certain level into. So you want to set up this unified stream of events as much as possible and understand the gaps of where your um, visibility is. So just to wrap, to give you your keys, your key takeaways here, because I know there's a lot of different stuff. This is not your normal security talk, but it's important to understand that this is coming, right? The business value here is clear. Development teams are moving to this way, especially when we started to push more operations onto development teams. All of a sudden, we started getting better solutions to deploy things with lower operational burden. And that was the goal. We need to do the same thing for security. Serverless is a key to that because you're pushing a lot of the security elements um, out to these individual security providers. But it's still your responsibility to ensure that all of these individual efforts are meeting your requirements and the aggregate is also secure enough. So to do that, we wanted to focus on four major areas. We wanted to focus on data flow. So this was mapping out where your data is going within uh, your set of services and whether or not there are adequate controls at each place. We wanted to look at code quality. So has the code been reviewed? Is it uh, vulnerable to buffer overflows or to other common uh, attack ex uh, vectors? Also really taking a strong focus on third party libraries. So open source stuff that we're downloading, looking at that long dependency chain in Node.js and ensuring that we're not opening ourselves up um, to a known vulnerability, which means there's a known exploit out there. Um, we also looked at extending third parties a certain level of trust, understanding what that trust was and working right up to that boundary. So ensuring that you know, you know where that line is and pushing to that line but not going further. So not saying I'm going to give unencrypted personal identifiable information to a third party that's outside of the EU, but understanding that within the EU I'm comfortable with my data um, being in Denmark or in Holland and being encrypted at rest as long as my keys are staying within the UK. So uh, understanding that trust, working right up to that trust, and of course, as always, monitoring. Understanding what's going on in the application, understanding whether what you're seeing is normal, um, if it's an issue, and being able to set up these automated responses. So the serverless environments are all um, addressable through code. That's a huge advantage for development. It's also a huge advantage for security because you can start to set up these um, automated incident response scenarios where if you saw something really bad, you could send users to a temporary landing page that says, you know, we're currently investigating an issue and you could stop the, um, you know, initiate automatic containment. Um, or update code automatically. Um, lots of really interesting scenarios, but you need to develop a strong relationship with your development team in order to implement that. So those are the big four. You want to focus on data flow, code quality, third-party trust, and monitoring. That's how you're going to get a comprehensive view um, and a comprehensive approach to securing serverless applications. This is a brand new area. There's not a lot of third-party tools out there. There's some really interesting open source stuff, but everybody's breaking new ground here, even though it's an old concept. Um, but if you get in early and start establishing that relationship, you will be better off because you won't be bolting security on. You're going to be pushing through and you're going to be building it together with the business teams, with the development teams. And that means you're going to have security by design, which is always, always a smart play. So thank you for taking the time. I appreciate you watching this live. I appreciate you watching this on demand. I'm always reachable. Um, you can find me on Twitter, MarkNCA, 
always happy to chat about um, serverless security, about cloud security, security in general. Um, I think we're all better off when we share uh, knowledge freely. So please, any questions, comments, concerns, um, hit me up on Twitter. Um, thank you again for uh, taking the time. Mark, thank you very, very much. Um, really great, really great. Um, and I learned an awful lot on that, and that was fantastic. Um, you hit the hour spot on. Um, I was just going to make one comment um, as you went through, and this was about sort of data, your data flow analysis. Um, and obviously, GDPR um, in Europe is bringing in this concept of uh, document, documented privacy by design. Um, yep. So hopefully, that is going to force people into actually uh, doing this properly and sitting down and understanding your data flows. I think it will, and I think um, also there's a lot of good opportunity there. So it unfortunately is a manual exercise today, but there's a huge amount of value in that exercise, um, no matter how you tackle it. Um, but I think it will get easier as more people go through the process, realizing that we can automate some of it. Um, but it's it's if you get all parties at the table, like I said, spring for some for some snacks, book a morning. And get them around and you get a much better understanding not only of the security but of the application itself um, and it's it's a win all around and it helps build that team that inner uh, inner team communication as well absolutely and with that uh, we've hit the hour so thank you very much indeed thank you mark uh, thank you for listening um, and uh, we will see you next month thank you